How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. The patrons have spoken yet again, and today we have Dr. Tamitha Scove on the Space Weather Woman, and she's going to explain why we should care about space weather. She's going to hit you with a lot of information. This is going to be a longer form video than the, the cool little smaller digestible stuff that we normally get on Ham Nation, so I hope you are all very ready for that. Enjoy the memes as we're going to get started real soon. How's it going, everybody? I'm Josh KI6NAZ. This is the Ham Radio Crash Course. Now, if you've watched Ham Nation in the past, you will sometimes see Amateur Radio Newsline has a little blip towards the end with Dr. Tamitha Scove talking about space weather. And for those of you, it's always felt to me like you, you kind of had to know a little bit. She's really good at explaining, but, but it's so compact and there's so much information and there's so much excitement going on. I thought, and actually you patrons all thought, why don't we have Dr. T on one of the hour-long shows on Saturday and we get a better picture, a broader picture of what the heck all of this means. So if you're excited about this, you can thank all the patrons that voted for this that is making this happen. So we appreciate Dr. T taking the time. First, a couple of things I do have to hit. We are rolling into the news season time. People have events coming up, and, and boy, howdy, I want to make sure we get to them. But if you want to support the channel, hamtactical.com is the place to go. It is our merch store that my wife runs. Uh, in fact, as things start to get cool again, it might be time to pick up your appliance operator's local FN51 uh, sweater. They're available in a couple of different colors and whatnot. Uh, so go check that out at hamtactical.com. We have a very fun event coming up called Hellfest. This will be in Held uh, Fell, will be the mode of, is that right? That should be right. Yeah, Feld Hell uh, in October. I believe it will be Friday the 13th. I will try and participate and be live on that one. So uh, make sure you go check out the link in the description for Hellfest. In fact, I will drop it in the chat so nobody misses out on that. Uh, should be pretty straightforward. You will need to get some kind of software running for that, likely. Uh, FL Digi probably will be the mode you'll use most likely on that. Route 66 on the air is a thing. I am uh, now two stations in. That's right, two stations. I believe I got W6M this afternoon or N. Uh, I think it was W6N this afternoon or M. Can't remember. No, it was it was it was Kansas. Uh, got that this afternoon. So go check out um, them. They're all over the bands, but you can go to the web. I'll drop the link in the chat for that as well, so you guys can. Ah, Don's already got three of those stations. And yeah, they are going to be on HF for when you're out on the air. You'll hear them. You'll hear them all over the place. Now, this is kind of a last call thing. Ham Radio Adventures, we 4 dx which is an online amateur radio club that specializes in adventures, going out and doing a ham radio adventure. Thinking, of, Think of it as like kind of a, a DX expedition ham club. That's kind of what they're aiming to be. Pacific Beach 2023 is coming up. This is the fourth, uh, I think this is the fourth one they've done. Yeah, the fourth one. Uh, it is a week-long event, basically, five days. Goes from October 11th to the 16th. I will also drop the link for this in the show notes and the after chat or the chat room for everybody so you guys can go check it out. Uh, this is actually an organized event. You pay a sum of money to be able to have room and board and food and everything laid out for you. You, you probably bring some radios and some other gear, but it's uh, it's really cool. There's going to be a Pico balloon launch, a solar eclipse, QSO party, antenna build workshop, crash course on fox hunting or RFI hunting. Hands-on instructions, VE sessions for use that need to take a test or maybe upgrade to extra huh? or upgrade to general. And uh, pizza night. All right, pizza night. And, of course, there'll be parks on the air stations and whatnot. So uh, go check that out. Go check out the Pacific Beach at hamradioadventures.com because uh, the, the last day to enroll for this is the 15th of September. And you can see all those podas that they have coming up. All right. All right. Well, hopefully... 
Dr. Tamitha Scove is uh, someone you are familiar with watching Ham Nation here on the Ham Radio Crash Course. But I'm excited, and I hope you all are, that we get to talk with her in longer form for the whole hour, basically, here. So what we're going to do, we've got some things. i got some questions that I want to ask, and then she's going to go through a lot of what she does on Ham Nation, but longer form and explaining it. And then we're going to take questions from you. And we may have a, a little part halfway in the talk here where you get to actually decide what we talk about. So make sure you guys are active in the chat so we uh, know where to go. Spacewarethewoman.com is linked in the description for this video. And go check her out on YouTube. That's right. She's also there on YouTube as well. So without further ado, let's say hi to Dr. Tamitha Scove. Dr. T, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for being on. Uh, I'm I'm very excited to kind of understand more, right? We get such a little taste during Ham Nation. We want to flesh right. it out, kind of kind of make make people understand why this is important. Space weather. Yep. Understood. And mm -hmm. and it is important. I thought you were going to roll in right with questions. So Well, no, so I, I, was, I was a little, little banter. I'm, I know you're already standing. I know you're <laughs> such a ball of energy. But I, I, I will ask this because I actually haven't really, um, I didn't really, this was not on the list. So sorry, I'm hitting you with a, a, a wild foul, uh, side ball, cor curve ball here. How long have you been doing these like news reports on space weather? Oh, my goodness. Uh, really about, really about 10 years. It's kind of hard wow. to know exactly when I started mm -hmm. because it, it it started accidentally. Mm -hmm. I, I was I was originally on Twitter for music, not for for really? space weather. And and but it, the solar cycle twenty four was beginning to rise, and I started seeing lots of people, lots of tinfoil hat wearers running around screaming that that the you know every that the sky was falling. And and I said no no no, it's just the sun. It's just an active phase, and don't worry about it. And the more I questions that I would answer for people on Twitter trying to calm them down, the more intelligent questions I got back, and the more oh. the, the more my feed began to be filled with space weather stuff and less filled with music. And pretty soon it just completely took over my entire Twitter feed. And believe it or not, even the name. Uh, space weather woman that was given to me by the community i, I didn't come up with it oh wow so, yeah uh, there's so actually it there's actually a picture on your website of you with a mandolin is that your preferred instrument <laughs> one of them yes I, one I, of them i, I kept good. myself yeah i kept myself sane uh through grad school by running creating and running a re recording studio studio a, a digital recording studio and i so i did albums for people i had my own band uh, I wrote my own music, and I actually even toured. I toured in, in multiple, wow. had multiple tours uh, all over the United States, and uh, really, it it helped me get through uh, just being a scientist. I couldn't just be a scientist alone. So, Kept so that's sanity. how it all started out, <laughs> right? But then it exactly. But then when I met my husband, he was in video, and he he worked in the entertainment industry, and he said, "Well, if you can do audio as well as you do, because I have a, a studio with lots of sure. gear in it." He said, can you do video as well? And I said, sure, well, I have to learn. But I started to learn how to do it. And as I did that, uh, I had a lot of my colleagues in Space Weather saying, we need people on the Weather Channel because this is getting serious. And and I just kind of looked around at my gear and what I was able to do. And I said, and I looked and I thought about my expertise and I said, gosh, it seems like the universe is trying to tell me something. I, maybe a little bit. <laughs> so, so that's what happened is it just kind of snowballed into that. So I think right around 2015 is when I, I really said, okay, I'm going to do it on a green screen. I'm going to get serious mm -hmm. about it and try to make it like a terrestrial weather broadcast. I love so, it. Wow. What a yeah. cool backstory. I didn't know that that yeah. would be the, the question that would give us such a background on you, but that's amazing. Uh, really quick yeah. shout out to David Bruce says time for a Dr. Tamitha drinking game. Now, everybody be careful. <laughs> this is a, a, a much longer than the ham nation segment and Amanda's not here. <laughs> So you're all on your own with how you're going to handle the drinking game on this one. Everybody be careful, though. I don't want any wait. emergency calls. Yeah, wait, wait. Does it have to say BAM? Do I have to? Cause you got, I'll yeah, only you, do that at the very uh, end. They'll be, they'll be okay until the very end when okay. I do a forecast. And okay. Then we'll, we'll yeah, talk the about forecast, the I think, is what gets people. That's what really takes them out. <laughs> so I'll, I'll kick it off with the why should, ha why, why should hams care about space weather? Obviously, this could be some heady stuff. You're a very learned individual. Went to school for a long time to learn this. We're some hams that are just trying to make contacts with RF. Why should we care about this stuff? Ham should care about space weather for several reasons. Number one, because you're on the front lines of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, there is no doubt. Anytime the sun decides to do anything, you you have to deal with with whatever the sun puts out. And it's not even just the sun. It's it's how the Earth's system 
copes with space weather. Uh, so because the Earth is very responsible for, for a lot of the havoc that you go through as well. But of course, when you talk about emergency radio, emergency management and, and emergency uh, services, you're, you're going to be dealing with that. And we'll, if you guys, if everyone wants to at the end, I'll talk about a particular event that shows, that demonstrates why space weather is so incredibly important to ham radio and why so many people get it wrong. And ham radio operators are actually going to be the ones that that correct a lot of these, these official FEMA people and Red Cross people saying, no, 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 it's not what you think it is. It's actually space weather because you guys will be in the know. So that's another reason. And then the third reason mm. is, believe it or not, just like we colonized Earth right back way back when, and we became ham radio <laughs> operators, we learned how to do Skywave, right, in, in the, the, what, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. I mean, that's, that's kind of when we really were, were using it as a, a main form of communication. That same kind of thing is going to happen again. Mm -hmm. That is the Mars generation. As yeah. we colonize Mars, we're going to have to learn how to do over-the-horizon communication all over again. Because we're not going to be able to go up to the satellites and ping off the satellites when there's inclement space weather. Because space weather, the 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 atmosphere can go opaque to satellite transmission. So we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. And so, really, amateur radio operators today, you're the Elmers to the Mars generation. You know, I really, um, I haven't really thought about that. What what is the uh, atmospheric conditions on Mars? Uh, is HF radio even possible there? The atmosphere's got to be very, very tiny, very thin. It's it's very tenuous, but there is still a magnetic field. Now, it's not okay. a, a big magnetosphere. There isn't a big, you know, like a big shield like what we have. Mm -hmm. There's remnant field in Mars, but it does still, it's still strong enough. It's it's much, it's ordered much differently, but it's still strong enough to, uh, to, to cause aurora. It's still strong enough to shield out the solar wind from the upper atmosphere. That's why the atmosphere still exists. Mm -hmm. And we still have an ionosphere at Mars. Oh. Now, the frequencies are going to be very different. Sure. But... Uh, just like we were at Earth, we have to learn what those frequencies are. There's been a lot of work that's been done, especially by the Air Force and and the Naval Academy. People have been doing. I've seen master's theses on mm -hmm. on how to use radio frequencies on Mars and what would they be for over the horizon communication. But that's going to be a big yeah, deal before uh, until we get repeaters in, right? Until mm -hmm. we get things where we can do direct wave and and uh, what are we going to do when we have to to talk to a sortie that's you know over the horizon? We're going to have to rely on SkyWave. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, so you, we will have to completely relearn which frequencies. We wouldn't just be doing line of sight, and if we didn't have repeaters, um, all of that would be... Oh, you could have a repeater on a balloon, right? <laughs> Assuming we brought our own helium there, or some kind of lighter than air, because, well, no, even Perhaps. then, that's that's heavier... But. But oh, the, now the you got me going down. That, now I'm circling right. the drain thinking but about it. That's you can't fantastic. Control it, but you can't control the balloons, right? Mm -hmm. So, and when the when the colonists get there yeah. at first, especially if there ends up being inclement space weather on the way, somebody out in the field has got to come in because space weather, or inclement space weather, comes all the way down to the surface of Mars. Unlike Earth, right. where the radiation storms, for example, are absorbed by our upper atmosphere. Not so at Mars. They come all the way to the ground. So space weather is much more dangerous at Mars than it is even here at Earth. So you better be able to get a, get a, a radio call out to anyone out in the field to tell them to come back to home base or get into a bunker, get, get under something so that they are safe. Let alone and, that our radios themselves could just be dead right. <laughs> from exactly. the weather alone. Because, because it will go, yes, you will, yeah. everything will go radio silent. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what is the, I mean, on the heels of that, here's a, here's a follow on question. What is the biggest misconception hams have about space weather? I think there's two misconceptions. It depends upon if you're, if you're a ham radio operator who believes, who, who is knowledgeable in space weather to some degree, mm -hmm. or if you're a ham radio operator who has, doesn't, doesn't have a clue that space weather even existed. If, if it's the, if it's the latter, it's more like, uh, people thinking that, that, space weather is either non-existent or catastrophic, right? We either have, it, it's, it's either a sunny day or it's like having a superstorm Sandy and, and, you know, it's just devastation everywhere mm -hmm. because that's what Hollywood depicts for space weather. I mean, it's just like anything in Hollywood, right? Everything is going great. And then suddenly everything goes South on you and you're, you're in, you know, hell in a handbasket. Um, but with the, so that's, that's, and, and that's not what space weather is. Space weather is very much like terrestrial weather in that there are many sunny days, but there are also drizzle, right? Light rainstorms, heavier rainstorms. And then, of course, there are the big storms that you have to deal with. And it goes, it's a continuum 
It's not just not not just a light switch where it's either non-existent or catastrophic. So so that's one of the big things because people a lot of people really fear space weather, um, and they think it doesn't happen very often unless it's a big event. The ones though that are are educated, we're actually we'll actually talk about that when I go through these charts. Excellent. So we'll actually talk about how what are the what is a big misconception that I hopefully can help dispel. I love it. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to belabor it. Uh, you've definitely got. I, I know you have some slides you've worked on. But the big thing I want everybody watching to to keep an uh, an ear out for uh, is what is the takeaway from this? Like as as we're doing this, because I know there's a lot of really good information. You've been doing this for a while. You got ham radio people watching. What would be kind of the thing that they should look for as far as a takeaway of of something to walk away from this? Something I think that probably the biggest thing I have to say this you know as a perfunctory response obviously I'm not I'm not digging really deeply here I'm just trying to answer quickly but I think from this short primer I'm going to give you is that there really are two chefs in the kitchen and this, the the slide I'm standing on is is really a perfect perfect uh, slide for that this here this is what I call the first chef okay this here is what I call the second chef because mm. the first chef basically throws eggs. Because they're both in the sure. kitchen. Yeah. So first chef throws eggs, and I guess I should say it this way, right? The, the first chef is throwing eggs over. If I'm if I'm the son, I'm throwing yeah. eggs over to the second chef. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the second chef then takes those eggs, and that's what the solar phenomena are. Grabs those eggs from the first chef and cracks them into this near Earth skillet. That's what this is. Okay. Scrambles it up and makes scrambled eggs, and then tosses that scrambled eggs on. And down the sky, and the, and the ham radio operator standing on the ground looking up for an egg, expecting an egg, and they get scrambled eggs on their plate, and they're like, what the hell is this? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're like, this looks nothing like what the sun was throwing at us. How in the world did I get this? And so that's probably the big takeaway is okay. that it's not just all about, the, I have to figure out which side I'm on, not just all about the sun. It's also about the Earth system. Yes, excellent. And that that makes things a little bit harder to interpret, and we'll we'll talk about why in the I, slides. I love it. So everybody, I'm already seeing questions at, you know, they're at Ham Radio Crash Course and questions coming up. That's great. We're going to take questions, but Dr. T's got a slide package that she's worked on. So we're going to let her get started because I'm I'm champing at the bit myself to see some of this stuff. And mm -hmm. then there'll be time at the end for, uh, for you to ask questions. So everybody stay tuned. Make sure you keep those questions in mind. We'll try and get to them. So Dr. T, the floor is yours. Thank you for being on. Let's awesome. talk. Yeah. Let's oh, see those slides. Okay. Cool. Right on. Okay, so I, this is often the slide that I show to begin with uh, for most people, uh, because people want to know why does space weather matter? Who who is who are the people that have come out of the woodwork to really care about space weather? And you guys are a huge part of it up here, right? Not just not just your just the, the amateurs who want to rag chew, but also the emergency services like ARAs and races, of course, ARRL if you're in the United States. But I mean, what do we have? Something like three million all around the world. Yeah. I, I forget what that's, the statistics are now. Pretty pretty close. Yeah, pretty accurate. Something close to that. Yeah. So so you guys are the are the are really on the front lines uh, and and a huge contingent, probably one of the biggest stakeholders of of uh, space weather. And anytime space weather goes south, you guys know about it. Oftentimes more, but even before I do. But we have other things that are kind of working side by side with you, which is the emerging drone market, right? Now we've known about, and, and the emerging GPS market, we know about precision agriculture. Farmers have been dealing with this for a very long time. Yes, John Deere tractors can't get lock on GPS satellites when there's inclement space weather. And it's frustrating for them. Um, cars, aut autonomous cars have the same problem, but it's not quite as bad because they've got other systems. Obviously our phones, these can cause problems because we use single frequency GPS. There's all sorts of issues there. But the big one that we're concerned about are, is this emerging drone, especially the delivery systems, right? Some of these delivery systems are delivering medical supplies. Others are, they're working on delivering human beings as like medevacs. This is quite crazy because these things have collision avoidance, but they don't have any any, uh, they don't have any algorithms in them to deal with what happens when they get signals that scintillate. Okay, signals that that do what we call twinkle, twinkle, little star. Right. And we'll talk if, more about what that it, means. It's kind of like trusting your eyes, right? They're they're they have to trust their GPS as their eyes. The, exactly, and, they can and be when their GPS. And when they get double vision, which is what happens. So thank you for using that analogy because that's what happens. They get double vision. So imagine trying to drive with double vision. 
Yeah. That's what happens with these these drones. And they suddenly look like drunken sailors in the sky because they they first trust one eye, then they trust the other eye. Then I was going to say, are, are these just again. drunk drones flying around, Dr. <laughs> drunk, T? We got, we got drunk drones. There goes the drinking game. OK, <laughs> it that's started. The first drink. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was going to be the forecast. I guess it isn't. <laughs> well, we're starting early. OK. So yes, drunk drones in the sky because of double vision. So so that is something that that I, personally I'm quite concerned about. But we also have the emerging uh, space tourism industry, right? We have we just had a, a Virgin Galactic flight mm -hmm. that went up, which actually went up during a radiation storm, which the passengers probably didn't know about. But yeah, they went up during a radiation storm. I wouldn't have. Right. But hey, it's it's up to them. And then, of course, Blue Origin, that's a, that's another one we've got. Uh, uh, that's another um, set of, of, of spacecraft that are planning on helping deliver passengers eventually to to the to space. We also have uh, and I don't have it up here. Worldview, which is a balloon company. They want to go up to the edge of space. There's like four or five other different balloon companies that are also doing it. Of course, we have Hotel ISS. We also have people on the ground, right? The traditional Aurora tourism. Mm -hmm. We have lots of things where people are going into space now, and that becomes a big issue. Um, and then, of course, SpaceX with Starlink and the O3B, the other 3 billion people on the planet who don't have internet, which we're getting these satellite constellations. We've already seen with SpaceX what the problems that they've had. I've been telling people since 2019 that Starlinks were going to fall out of the sky, and people laughed at me. Well, they're not you were laughing right. now. I was also screaming about now. that. <laughs> yep. Because it's, it's, you know, it's silly and we're just seeing it all the time. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully we'll get a handle on that. But there are a lot of a lot of uh, people now fighting over over drag, you know, basically drag calculations because the atmosphere inflates. And now they're trying to figure out how do we how do we not use too much fuel to try to keep these birds up in the sky? It's it's a it's an interesting world we live in right now. But that's a new a new thing. Of course, we have the old agencies. This is where space weather got its teeth, you know, cut its teeth was with the FAA and, yeah. and the Department of Energy, as well as Homeland Security and Department of Defense. Right. Those those were the agencies that really started space weather to begin with. And then, of course, we have the enthusiasts and we also have the media. All right. The media is beginning to pay attention to space weather. I keep seeing, luckily, we're, we're beginning to make an, an impression. And so every now and again, you'll see a space weather story on the news. Whether or not it's done quite right is a matter of debate, but you know we're getting there. But for us here at Earth, there's lots of different types of space weather, but really we can boil it down to four different phenomena, okay? The first one, if I stand in the right place, first one are solar flares, okay? And, and I'll get to the first, one of the first big myths of space weather here in just a second, but I'll show you what a solar flare is. I'm sure everybody knows in this crowd, but here is a solar flare. And we're about to go to the drinking game again, because in just a moment, you'll see the, bam. Right There's there. your bam. <laughs> There's the bam. This was like an X2 class flare. So it you can see it, right? As soon as you see this, this is what I call the sun screaming. Because as soon as you see the light, the sun is screaming in radio waves, as well as X-rays and gamma rays and EUV and all the other light that goes down there. Right. And all of it, as soon it, it all travels to Earth at the speed of light. So as soon as you see it in a satellite, it's hitting Earth. There is no warning, right? Because you can't travel, light can't travel faster than light. It just does. Mm -hmm. So it's about eight minutes from until we see it at, 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 on these in these uh, telescope observations and we are getting what is called a radio burst or uh, we're getting um, degradation in the ionosphere, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But that is when the sun is screaming. Now, the neat thing is that when the sun is screaming, if you can see the sun, you can hear it scream. But if you can't see the sun, we can't hear it scream. Hmm. And and one of the, the analogies that I can use is, is um, people, people often say, well, if the sun is screaming, it's screaming into this broad radio band, you know, all frequencies, right? It's, it goes from, from, you know, lower frequencies all the way up to, to 5G, essentially. I mean, you can get things up to, to 12 or 16 gigahertz. So yes, it can out, drown uh, Starlink out, in fact. Mm -hmm. And how that happens is that if you think about satellites, they're not being injured by this, okay? It's just noise. But what it what it is, it's like a cricket near train tracks, where if you can always hear a cricket chirping if it's near the train tracks, no problem, right? Until a train goes by. Then you have no idea. Is a, is a cricket chirping? Is it not? You have no idea until the train finishes going by and everything's quiets down again, and then you can hear the cricket. I, That's the same thing with a satellite. Can I ask okay? a question? Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, 
So some satellites can actually be damaged by flares, but that's usually a byproduct of poor shielding or something that can actually damage electronics. Or what's doing the damage? Is it just purely that is the... that's this? We'll get to that. Okay, okay. We'll I was I'm that. jumping ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Continue. See, sorry. And so this is good. I'm good. glad you yeah. asked that question because it's the only people. The only oh, I gotta be careful. The only thing that gets damaged from a solar flare is if you're if you're nuts enough to just stare at it, like staring okay. at the sun. Okay. So yes, optics can get that, and and I and I know a couple people. People who've done that, some of my scientist colleagues have have damaged satellites by turning off all the flare protections, and I won't mention their names, but yeah, they got they they literally said they got caught with their pants down. Um, that was back in 2006 during a big big solar flare. But uh, for the most part, <laughs> we're pretty good at not getting damaged by by basically not staring at the sun for too long if our optics can't handle it. But that again, that's just light. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so even if it's a radio wave, it, all it does is it's just drowning out the signal. Okay. So the, the GPS signals or the Starlink signals or any of these other radio, the satellite signals that we're getting, they're not being injured. They will recover. You will hear them again. You just have to wait for the sun to stop screaming and just mm -hmm. drowning everybody out. Okay. Which only lasts a couple hours. Okay. Now, if you're on the night side, of course, you don't hear the sun scream. So doesn't bother the satellites one bit. You can get GPS reception or anything else at that time. Now, this is one of the other concerns or the other myths is that a solar flare is the same thing as a solar storm or what's called a coronal mass ejection. Okay, Coronal mass ejections and solar flares often happen at the same time, but that doesn't mean you can conflate the two together. They are completely independent of one another. A solar flare can happen without a CME and a CME can happen without a solar flare. They don't have to happen together, but they oftentimes do. The biggest issue with that is that coronal mass ejections are very different, okay? These are big hunks of material. We talk about the, the sun belching, sadly to say, this junk out of the sun, okay? And so that's what you're looking at here. You're seeing that lunch, lunch out. Here on this side, here's the sun, this tiny little sun here. Now you're looking at a coronagraph view out to basically uh, 15 solar diameters, so 15 sun lengths out, okay? And I'm gonna pause this thing real fast. Because hopefully you can still see that circle. Can you still see that yeah. loop? Yeah. Okay, good. So you can still even see the, the feet of this thing still sticking out. So this that's coming out of the sun right here. And you can see how massive this thing is, how wide, how large it gets. Okay, it's much, much larger than the sun, even that close to it. Now, Earth, of course, is way, way, way out from mm -hmm. here. But the, the, the thing with coronal mass ejections is that they're slow because they're carrying material. So it's not eight minutes from when it actually occurs on the sun that we see it at Earth. This takes days, okay? And when this, this thing hits, this thing doesn't cause necessarily your HF radio to, to get wonky, especially on the day side. It doesn't have to. Sometimes it does, but not that much. But the night side is, my, is a nightmare. Why? Because when this thing hits Earth, it's actually hitting Earth's magnetic shield. It's, it's hitting that second chef that I was talking about. And it's going to give stuff to that second chef to, to kind of toss inside the Earth's magnetic system, and we'll talk about what that what happens there. But imagine if you have, oh, pardon me. Imagine if you have, um, my, my apologies. Oh, you're good. Uh, imagine if you have two magnets, okay? So you take, think of two fridge magnets. If you take these magnets and you, and, and one of them is this coronal mass ejection, and the other one is the Earth's magnetic system, you have these two magnets. Now, if they're the same polarity, right? Mm -hmm. You can feel them. They'll repel, right? North and north against north. It, they, they don't like being nearby. So they'll bounce off each other. And the, the big solar storm will just go on by and, you know, just be a bumper car. But if you flip one of them over, right? If you take the magnetic, this and flip the, flip the, the thing over and have it be uh, northward and southward mm -hmm. pointing, now they will stick. They, they click together just like fridge magnets do. And they make their magnetic systems become one. And so all of the junk from this thing gets pumped into the Earth system. Uh, okay? It okay. opens the Earth system up. And we'll talk, we'll, I'll actually show a movie of how that happens. Okay. But what it does by pumping all that stuff in, it actually hit, pumps stuff up the tail. You'd think it would pump stuff in from the front, but it doesn't. It pumps stuff in from the backside, from the far side. <laughs> so this affects the day side. This primarily affects the night side. This occurs in eight minutes. For, and lasts a couple hours. This occurs days later and lasts for days. Mm. 
See why you can't conflate the two? Sure. Because again, one's light and the other is material, and that material is getting sucked into our radiation belt or you know our, our protective our layer, magnetic, our, magne our magnetic yeah. system. And I know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to script these terms, so thank you for correcting me. You, but you yeah, it, it's Pretty getting all won't. cooked in the skillet, if you will. It's getting thrown in the That's scillet right. with the eggs. And okay, scrambled. got it. <laughs> and you'll see how it gets scrambled soon. Now, I often talk about the third thing. This is the other big thing is solar radiation storms. We also call them solar energetic particle events. They are caused by both of these, okay? So this is another way things get conflated. And I always talk about solar radiation storms as kind of being like the glue that holds together these two phenomena. And why do I say that? Well, because solar radiation storms get launched during a solar flare, but then the, the this coronal mass ejection, the front end of it, if there, there's typically a shock wave in front of it, and it carries these particles and energizes them and keeps them going. So what happens is that within about an hour after seeing the solar flare, you start getting these radiation storms hitting Earth because they're very energetic part. They are material, but they're energetic particles. They're, they're relativistic. So they get to Earth in about an hour or so, give or take, okay, depending. So you see them about an hour after a solar flare occurs, but then they keep coming until the CME hits because the CME is driving them and is energizing them. So it will keep on coming until this structure hits. Mm. So they'll last for days and days and days, see? And so once this structure hits, there's a radiation storm right there. You can actually see see that blizzard, wow. bam, right? So we had a, a big flare on the sun, and now a CME was coming, and then it did the, the big um, uh, radiation storm. And Look so, at that, wow, okay. And, and yeah, and what's happening is that you're getting energetic particles hitting the detector of, right. the, of the, like, think of your eyes, right? Like the, the, your eyes are the retina of your eyes. You would actually get particles, and as they par penetrate into your, into your eyeballs or into the CCD of this, of this excuse me, this detector, um, what happens is that it, they deposit energy, and that energy gets interpreted as light. Mm -hmm. It's not real light. But that's but your eyes work the same way. Even yep. astronauts, when there's a big radiation storm, actually talk about the fact that they can close their eyes and they see fireworks. They see the same thing that these that this sees when you when they get those big things. And you can see the big CMEs being launched out. See those puffs? Those yeah. are all CMEs being launched out have, have of the seen, in a chronograph. Have you seen those experiments they do with extremely cold temperatures in a in a fish tank where you can see the little like little bursts Trinank. through, like with thorium, like you, you, you have to, uh, yeah, you use like a piece of thorium or something like that to, to is, is this kind of a similar thing? It, that's our sensor that would catch them or is that no, just but, like a cosmic ray? But they, but they are, but they do have, uh, as a matter of fact, there are sensors that are like that. We typically mm -hmm. call them our uh, Trinankov counters, um, scintillation counters. And, and the reason why is because you do get a particle scintillation from them. In this case, mm -hmm. this is just simply electronic energy uh, elect electrons being deposited in the material. And because CCDs are measuring electricity anyway, they're measuring a, a potential and current. When you deposit charge because a particle is, is doing um, ionization damage through a material, now you're getting me really technical here. Sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's what, that, but that's what happens is that, it, it, that, that current, that potential and current is being measured and they're thinking, oh, that must be light hitting it because that's what's generating that current. But in, right. in fact, it's not. It's it's actually a particle hit. And there's streaks in all sorts of different directions because you're getting hit bombarded by particles right. going, you know, toward, you know, toward toward Earth, but but in many different with many different look angles. So so that's why it looks like a blizzard. And it absolutely blinds these these uh coronagraphs, sadly. So we can't even see the CMEs. But at Earth and I'll open this. If you guys are familiar with the DRAP model, radiation storms, as you'll see in just a moment, radiation storms populate up here. Watch, boom, right there, north and wow. south. And you'll talk. We'll talk about why that is in just a moment. But that's this is the radiation storm, okay? And absolutely causes havoc for amateur radio operators as well as people who want to navigate using GPS. All of that stuff at the higher latitudes, okay? This stuff here, this glowing stuff, this is the day side. This is the ionization from solar flares. So this is by ionizing the, what we call the D layer of the ionosphere. This is one way that solar flares and radiation storms can cause problems at Earth for amateur radio operators. Because you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that red means bad. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so... 
I got in a fight okay. with somebody about that recently. They started using Did red you? to be good on one of our displays, and it was a big problem. But <laughs> right, right. I mean, you know, come on, red, red is always stop, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the one other thing that you have to worry about, well, you won't have to worry about this until the declining phase of the cycle, are these big coronal holes. Now, no, coronal holes are not holes in the sun. They're just areas where you get cool solar wind and, and fast solar wind. And so it's darker because it's cooler. So it looks like there's a hole, but it's really not. It's just in this wavelength, it's not emitting light. So you see this, but this is really where you get fast solar wind coming from. And just like a bow of a boat pushing through the water in a, in a still lake, as that bow of the boat pushes through, it creates that bow wave, right? And that mm -hmm. compresses everything. Well, when you get that in the solar wind, it mimics these. So fast solar wind and coronal mass ejections aren't that much different in terms of how Earth looks at them, because Earth responds to them as well. So those are the main phenomena. Okay. 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 And, yep. and, okay. Oops, hang on. Let me get through this. Okay. So before I jump into really what this what the the second chef is doing but I, let me let me just let me just recap this is the first chef and these are the types of eggs the four different types of eggs that the, that this first chef throws perfect at Earth. perfect okay perfect analogy so that's, I, i'm following 100 percent. <laughs> okay cool <laughs> cool so so before we jump into what the second chef's job is let's jump into something that's a little bit more comfortable right for amateur radio operators that's the ionosphere right now the ionosphere is a charged plasma region you guys know that that is above the upper atmosphere, the neutral atmosphere, and it. And the only reason that it it, um, it isn't neutral is because it's being bombarded by the sun. The sun photoionizes all the the constituents that are up in that region. Now, atmospheric. There's all these different types of atmospheric chemistry that occur, and they occur at different because because the the composition of the upper atmosphere is changing, and as it changes, that means the chemistry changes. Well, as that changes, well, then that changes how, whether or not you're ionizing stuff more or you're recombining stuff more. And so it's always this tug of war between ionizing and creating electrons or recombining and, and capturing electrons. And it's a tug of war between the two, the two sides. So depending upon where you are in that upper atmosphere, that atmospheric chemistry will either favor the ionization or it will favor recombination. Where it favors ionization, that's where we get a layer. One of these, a D, E, F, one, F, two layer, that's where we get those layers. Where we favor recombination is where the layers aren't. So that's kind of how the charge layer that, even though it's just the sun raining down, you know, just sending its, its photons and having those photons hit the different molecules and different uh, elements in the air, um, or species, I should say, um, it's it's really all what happens with that charge. Does it stay right where it's been created? No, it doesn't. Those those particles move around, and sometimes they get recombined, and sometimes they don't. But it always seems to strike in all these different layers. So it's like a very you know intense layer cake, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah. Okay. And and that's why these layers, as you can even see, the aurora comes in layers for a slightly different reason. But but you still see you know the idea of like what the layers and how thin they can be. Um, but these charge layers, they facilitate radio propagation, right? Skywave radio propagation. And and that's just with the quiet sky, the quiet night sky. That's just with, with normal, just sun, just a sunny day in space. When you have space weather on top of that, that really affects the ionosphere in very dramatic ways. And you can see it again with the ionosphere right here. You can see suddenly we have aurora. And so when you have aurora propagation, that's a classic space weather um, altering of, of skywave propagation. And why do the layers change? Well, because we go from the day side to the night side. Right. Right. And we go and we have the F1 and the F2 layer. They they collapse into an F layer and you have the D and the E layer. All those they generals, also, right? All these ham generals should be knowing this. All the right? generals the, should the, be. <laughs> well, remember, technicians even too, right? Yeah. But remember, yeah. the gray line, which is this region here, notice it's not a line. When you get up into the atmosphere, it's only a line on the surface of the planet. Ah. The gray line isn't a line, it's a region, guys. It's a big region. And why is that? Because the further up you are in altitude, the longer you can see the sun. Makes sense. Think about it. How many times have you been down on the surface of the earth and you look and the sun is set mm -hmm. and you look up in the sky and you watch a plane go by and you're like, dang, there's still sunlit. <laughs> you watch them fly right. by. Right, okay, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Same thing. Uh, a big guru one time said, I think a, a, an Indian guru said, if you ever want to see the sunset twice in one day, go climb a mountain. 
That's how you can do it. If you climb fast enough, you'll see it. But it's the same sure. thing that the right. D layer, of course, the sun will set really, really, you know, close to that terminator. So the D layer won't last very long past past the terminator on right. the ground. Because you're closer layer to will the last ground. A little bit yep. longer. Yep. The F1 will last a little bit longer and the F2 even longer because it can see over the horizon further. Mm -hmm. So that D line, that D, that gray region becomes a ma I mean, the gray line becomes a massive region. And that should really change your perception of how you look at the ionosphere, even for hams that are 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 skilled. You should look at it as a, a day side, a night side, of course, right? And then a gray region mm -hmm. where things are rapidly changing, right? But not changing like a light switch. And that's what facilitates that, that trans-hemispheric propagation, because you're getting such interesting changes going on in the gray region that you're not getting anywhere else. So I always loved this plot because it was one of the few that actually showed this, that actually showed the gray line as a region, and they called it the sundown region. Right, but this is neat because in increasing skip frequency is kind of the same thing, right. showing the D layer, E layer, and they simplified it with the F layer. But you can see that the, the D layer just, as soon as you hit the gray region or the gray line, however you want to call it, the terminator, this thing dies off very quickly. The E layer takes longer. Sure. Right, and they're saying here they're showing it dying off, but it's you know probably more like sporadic E much of the time, especially now that we're near solar max. You get these puffy little. I always look at the E layers like being uh, like clouds. I bet you the ionospheric layers look very, very much like clouds do. If you were able to visualize that, especially in the in the E layer, because it's just they just you know they seem like they're just your catch is catch can to actually bounce the signal off a cloud. Wish you could see them. Well, yeah, because if it was like a blanket, <laughs> aim. if it was blanket, we'd always get the same HF propagation to the same location every time. So it has to be sources of intensities, pockets, if right. you will. Yeah, and that makes have, sense. And the same thing, the gravity waves and all the Kevin Helmholtz instabilities, all the things you see at the bottom of puffy clouds and all of that stuff, that happens with the ionosphere as well, because it's really not different, but much different. But we don't teach it that way, do we? We teach it as a very smooth layer. Uh, well, we call it a line, and a line implies just you're either in or you're out, right? But that's right. Uh, it's a range, and I, I love you taking the time to explain that. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I'm sure everybody here knows that, you know, as you, as, as you transition from the day side to the night side, right, the top bands, of course, are what you can use more in the night side, the top bands you can't use during the day at all. But, you know, things, things change, things change dramatically. But you also have not just the day side or the night side, you have that gray region. So you need to look at the, uh, the atmosphere as being a three different types of atmosphere that you're dealing with on a daily basis and how, and depending on who you're talking to, even if you're, if you're, if you're somewhere, for instance, let's say you're in the gray line, in this gray region somewhere, and you want to talk to somebody on the night side. Well, or even if you're on the day side and you want to talk to somebody on the night side, well, use the frequencies that are, that are effective on the night side, mm -hmm. right? Use your 40 meters, use your 20 meters, even if you're on the day side, cause you're close enough to that gray region right. that you probably can make it. Right. And if you're on the night side and you want to talk to someone on the day side, don't be shy. Use the day side bands because you probably will make it. Right. And that's and that works even at solar minimum. So you have to think about which which where the sunlight is to the in the with the person that you're trying to contact or the area that you're trying to contact. Mm -hmm. And that can actually help a lot, a lot more than you might think. But once again, we talk about these as being smooth in actuality. Uh -uh. <laughs> Space weather and terrestrial weather ends up being a real problem and causes these layers to be far more undulating and cloud-like, okay? And one of the things we have to, and this is what makes the ionosphere so, so crazy, at least from below. When we talk about um, terrestrial weather, we have things like atmospheric heating instabilities that puff up and they cause things like plasma bubbles. They actually, you actually can have like inversions where you actually have atmosphere lighter uh, um, atmosphere kind of plowing right through this. If you guys ever remember the Tonga explosion, if you saw the Tonga explosion from space and you saw this, this big cloud that just popped all the way up, mm -hmm. it's kind of like that, just on a much smaller scale. But we get that and they poke holes right through these regions. They bow them up and they bow up even the F regions. Okay, So these are not like mirror surfaces. They're always undulating and moving. 
We have waves in, in neutral and charged regions. We have currents in the charged regions. We have winds that blow back and forth. All of these things cause, you know, these weather patterns cause changes in these layers to make them very erratic looking. And so what happens, of course, is that you have signal, not just, oh, I say reflection, it should be, it should, I just, I, I kept this on for a long time. That's I probably okay. should change the reflection. No, that, that works. Yeah. But, but reflection is really what it is when you get down to it. That's yeah, kind of it the is, but sense. it's but it's refracting, but it's refracting so much that it reflects. Yeah, yeah. Physicists get angry at me uh, for keeping. Uh, hands are fine with it. You're good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> we don't let Thank physicists you. in here. You're not gonna. You're I'm not gonna kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. No, no, no. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Whew, I was sweating. Um. So, but here's the thing: is that when you get to these these um the, the um interface interface between these layers. Right. If you start getting to an interface where these layers are changing, you're getting conductivity changes that are pretty dramatic. And so that can cause signal refraction here as well. And this doesn't happen just with SkyWave. It also happens with satellites. So you can imagine a satellite sending a signal down here, and then you get this refraction that you know bends it, and then another refraction, another refraction. And suddenly, a GPS signal that a, that a, re a GPS seat receiver is thinking that it's just a straight line, it's bent like crazy, kind of like the same way where if you put a pencil in water and you see it either it looks yeah. like it's bent or it looks like it's separate. Or sometimes the, the 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 way a laser beam will go through water or a prism, you know, that kind of thing. Exactly. And that's and, and that even gets to the signal scintillation that we were yeah. talking about here. So when you get these kind of things, you you know, you can obviously lose your lock. You can get amplitude fading, signal fading and uh, phase modulations, comb filtering, all sorts of weird stuff that you guys have seen. That's exactly what's happening with the aurora, by the way. When you do auroral propagation and you get that uh, 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 on the other end yep. where it's not that picket fencing. If you look at a, pictures of aurora, they actually call it picket fencing mm -hmm. because it's a little green pickets. So we, as amateur radio operators, we hear picket fencing in, uh, you know, from aurora propagation, and the amateur and the and the aurora photographers, they actually take pictures of the picket fences. It's really cool, but it's exactly the same phenomenon. Um, at any rate, what's what happens? And I think I have a, a movie here I wanted to show you. For example, when you get space weather on top of this, and this is a picture from Geochron. This is this is um, literally from January of this of, of just this year, you can see all the radio amateur radio contacts, right? And you've got the different frequencies. I don't know if you guys can read it down here, but you can actually watch as, as the sun goes by. Let me play this. Let's see if I can get out of the way a little bit. Actually, I'll stand right here. So you can see a, a little bit. Here's the sun. I might have to fast forward this. Well, uh, give us what's on the left side. Is that the high frequencies or the low frequencies? On so the, that's the, the legend. So, okay, let me pause. So the these are these are going to be um, I think you're looking at 60 and 80 meters up here okay. or 80 so and 60 the low and then you go down so you get down to um, I think if I can if I can read it now is that 10 um, 10 meters is pink yeah down okay here. that's okay that's so, 10 meters mm -hmm. you're here 17 that's kind of a bronze and 20 meters okay. is is here in yellow okay so you're doing a lot of there's a lot of 20 meters a lot, a lot of 20 of seven, yeah. um, and a lot of and a lot of there was a lot of 10 a moment ago let me. Let me see if I can play this. So what's happening right now is that you're getting this very big solar flare that's occurring, okay? And you can oh. watch these contacts disappear. Watch them. The whole frequent, the whole Pacific goes away. See it? I'll pause it right there. All those, all those contacts. Right, all those long, the, the cross, the cross Pacific. Cross Pacific, and yes, and mm -hmm. and then you, there were FA, FT8 contacts, and this remember FT8 is a is a very robust. Oh yeah, well uh, into the noise. Yeah. Very, very robust uh, thing. And you still, during this X flare, we actually watch all those contacts disappear. So that's in Japan right there second. you're pointing at, or around Japan, yeah. like, I'm guessing. Right. Yeah. And the sun was here. So the sun is in the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And yes, the solar flare, the center of that solar flare occurs there. So see it, they're all gone. Yes. See, they're gone over here. And then they'll come back. I'll, I, I speed it up here in a second. Now, this one didn't last all that long. I think it's going to come back. <laughs> okay, good. So you see, see, watch the the radio contacts, especially here and here. They'll start coming back once the yeah, yeah, yeah. is gone. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So you can see them coming cool. back. Yeah. Okay. And that's one ex example. Now let me show you another one. Whoops. Hopefully I'm. I'll show you another one. This is when we were closer to the northern hemisphere. So it matters depending upon where you are. And I put a, a copy of DRAP up here. So you'll see DRAP as well as, and you can see, so when the solar flare goes off, you'll also see it lighted up on the geochron. So here's the sun over here. 
Okay, and so the flare will start pretty quickly. And in this case, I think a lot of people are on 10 meters, which is the red traces, but you'll watch how they, they switch. To, they don't, because this isn't as strong a flare. They don't, they switch to higher frequencies. So here it is and everything, let me stop it. Everything then switches to, um, to 50 or to, I think 17 meters and 20 meters. So yeah, yellow 20. is 20 meters. Yep. So they went from 10 meters to 20 meters essentially to deal with the solar flare. And because this solar flare wasn't nearly as strong, it wasn't an X-class flare, it wasn't quite, it didn't drown everybody out, but it sure made them move up to higher frequencies. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how you mitigate, for those who don't know, that's how you mitigate a solar flare on the day side. Night side, if you can't see the oh. sun, you can't hear it scream. No problem. Uh, so clarification, we, we want to go to lower frequencies. Uh, no, higher frequencies. Higher frequencies? Solar flares. So they went higher up to frequencies. like 10 meters, 12, they 10, went, 15... No, they must have then. I, yeah. I must. Am I? Am I doing? I, I'm sorry. Did I say it wrong? Well, I must so have said it wrong. It's that. It's that weird ham radio thing that technically ten meters is a higher frequency. Forty oh, right, meters is right. a lower sorry. frequency. I'm. So, I'm. I said it completely wrong. I'm. I, 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 I know where you. Meters. Yeah. So they. they yeah, yeah. 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 They had to get off of ten meters to get down. They had to, to get off of. High, uh, no, they the, had to. The, they had the, to get off. They're on ten meters. Mm -hmm. I, no, wait. Excuse me. Now that I'm looking at it. 12 meters is mm -hmm. red. I thought it was 10 meters that is red. Okay. No, 12 meters is red. My and they, fault. they went from 12 to what, and 20? They went, they went from 12 to, they went from 12, 12 meters. You're right. Um, yeah. So they went from 12 meters to 20 meters, which they're basically elongating the size of the radio wave. So they're trying no, to. No, no, no. It has to be six meters then. That, that, that's, that's interesting. Okay. I have to go look. But okay. I do know that. What what happens? What happens is that you get low frequencies that end up getting. You can even see it on DRAP. Low okay. frequencies end up getting noise the most noise. This is the problem that I have with Geochron. I've got to talk to to Patrick as as we do this. The colors are change. similar. Yeah, because eighty meters is very <sighs> similar to six or ten or whatever. So it, yeah, they, they need different colors. They, yeah, but they use it because they use the colors that PSK Reporter uses. So it's very uh -huh. frustrating because that's the standard there. But that doesn't help scientists like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want a rainbow. I want something that goes very cleanly from, you know, one to, to you know, changing shades very cleanly right. from one to the next. I don't want to see duplicates. So I, I can't I can't tell you off the top of my head right here which which one of these, which way it goes. But I do know um, it's they're, if they're mitigating and they're dealing with the solar flare and they're trying to continue communicating, they have to go to higher frequencies Got it. when it's a solar flare. Okay. Always higher frequencies. Yeah, so during um, the day, that's going to limit you somewhat. Uh, but at night, it's pretty much radio blackout at that point, right? right because it can't, it, you're going to use you're going to use low frequencies at nighttime generally. But at nighttime, you don't care about solar flares. It only affects the day sun. Oh, because it's only looking at the you're looking at the sun. You have to be looking at it. You have to see the sun. Got so that's it. That's a nice thing. Got that's it. That's a nice thing. So when when it's when solar flares are a problem, and you can't you can't communicate. Go to the night side. You'll notice the noise is much, much quieter, and you won't have those intermittent radio blackouts. The biggest issue they have, though, is when you have solar um, storms, when you have big um, um, CMEs, big solar storms hitting Earth, and then you have to deal with aurora and everything else. And that can persist inside. into the nighttime or days, as, as you yes. mentioned. Around. Yeah. Yes, it can persist. It'll persist around, but it's mostly causing problems on the night side. It'll just cause problems on the night side for 36 or 48 hours. So whoever's on the night side is dealing with issues. And that can propagate around to the day side as well. It just takes a little bit longer, but it doesn't get nearly as bad. So let me talk about that. So now that we talked a bit about, about the ionosphere and and the, and uh, just saw a little bit of, of interaction with when you have solar flares occurring uh, with amateur radio, um, now let's kind of go back into something that you don't quite understand yet. And that is the second chef. How does the second chef inter cause all this, this ruckus here at the planet? Well, it's mainly because the Earth's magnetic system is a teardrop-shaped cavity. And they're looking, in this case, here's the sun, and you're looking down at Earth mm -hmm. right here, looking kind of over, like an overview of the system. And you see this, this kind of shell-like thing. And this is really the magnetic field. And the Earth is centered in here. And I always grab my slinky, and I'll show you why. Here's the Earth here. And so what you're looking at really is kind of a magnetic torus. It may not look like much, but I'm going to take this slinky. Slinkies are invaluable in space weather. <laughs> if you imagine Earth, I'm, I'm serious. I, I love it. Time. Yeah, 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 I love it. If you set a ball right here, like this is Earth, okay? Uh -huh. You set that ball, and then you take that, and you set it right here. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've got, see that I've kind of tilted yeah, it? Yeah. Tilted right there. That is what you're dealing with, with the earth. You have a magnetic system that is a slinky that wraps all the way around earth. That's earth's, that's the core of earth's magnetic system. Okay. And it's bouncy and springy. Okay. Now you can't see the magnetic field lines, but these magnetic field lines guide everything. You saw how in the loop of that big coronal mass ejection, why it was looped. It was looped because the magnetic field was looped. And the magnetic field jails all the particles because the particles in space are charged. So they see electric and magnetic fields and they must obey. Mm -hmm. So you can think of magnetic fields as being like the jailer of the particles. So because the Earth's magnetic system is this crazy shape, it really dominates and dictates what happens mm -hmm. in the Earth's system. Okay, But this shield stands off the solar wind Okay, and protects us from those eggs that the first chef is throwing at us. And the particle motion, like I mentioned, the motion and dynamics uh, are controlled by the, magnetis magnetics, uh, by the magnetosphere. Mm -hmm. That's what we call this. And you can see there's all sorts of little tiny, you know, microclimates, microenvironments. Right. Like there's all these different regions. Of course, there'll be a test after this. So you have to know. Oh, of course. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Right. And there's a bunch of, of regions of interest. So when you talked about the Van Allen radiation belts, that's just one small portion that's in here. Okay. It's actually part of what is in this. You can part, This is like a particle accelerator. The heart of the Earth, Earth's magnetic system is a particle accelerator. And so you can get particles to go... It's like the CERN, right? Just a much bigger version of oh, it. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's an interesting that's, way of looking at it. All right, okay. That's uh, exactly why you have gotcha. radiation belts where you have them. Okay, yeah. okay. But, there's, but that's just one of many different microenvironments that exist. You have the radiation belts, you have the ring current, plasma sphere. I mean, it's just, it just goes on and on and on. These are just a few. And here's another view of it. Okay, in this case, you're looking at it from the side. Once again, magnetic field, that's the red lines. And here is the way it looks here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this Earth's magnetic system, you can see the loops. So they're like nested slinkies. Here's the inner part of it. But then there's a bigger slinky that goes around it and a bigger slinky that goes around it and a bigger slinky that goes around it. Sure. And they just keep building them out. Okay, and what ha what what happens with this system is that it actually rotates and tilts. So when I'm going to show you a movie, and you'll see okay. the system actually rotating and tilting. Yeah. I'll ask the dumb question because I'm, I'm sure most people know this, but I want to make sure everybody gets it. The reason why it's all elongated to the right side is that's the, the night side of Earth, and everything's yes, getting blasted the by the sun, solar winds, and everything else are pushing on that slinky. And the yep. slinkies upon slinkies is, upon slinkies. This is, yes, and, you, and you're, it's compressing this end, and it's elongating the back because Got the solar it. wind is blowing from the sun this way. Mm -hmm. So you can see that you can see that this, the day side of Earth here, and then that's the night side. So you're looking down at the at the Earth from the North Pole. Here's, I mean, excuse me, down at. I shouldn't say down. I should say you're looking. Here is the North Pole up here. You're looking at the Sun. Here's the equator of Earth. Here's the North Pole of Earth. Here's the South Pole of Earth. Right. So it's going to tilt just on our seasons on the axis of the Earth as well, right? Right. right. And, and it, uh, uh, yeah. You're right. Yeah. The magnetic system. At, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's exactly. And so if I can make this movie go, okay, here we go. So what you're, what I'm going to show you, you'll see those same views, that one where you're looking kind of down at the Earth system and then mm -hmm. the one that you're looking at the Earth system from the side. And I'll show you how dynamic this system is with several different events. Whoops. That should have been muted. Pardon me. No, we don't need the expert commentary. I'll be the expert commentary if we need it. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. So here's, so here's the solar wind coming in this way. And we're looking at magnetic field, okay? Mm -hmm. Here's the Earth's system, okay? Now, let me stop this for a sec. Ooh, back it up. Just something just hit. Yeah, yep, exactly. Whoop. Don't you love Max? Come on, let's try this. Yeah, again. we love Max here. Where's Ham Radio Tube? He's in the chat. <laughs> well, it, it, it rewinded it for me, and I didn't really want it to yet. Okay, so. This is cool animation. Though. As you can see. Yeah. So here is a, basically the Earth's magnetic system, or what I like to call the second chef at rest. Okay. So here it is, and you can see it. There's the big tail. And the reason why is because the solar wind is always blowing, and it right. presses in the front, and it elongates the back. So it's kind of okay? chilling. This is like Earth chilling. chilling. This is the normal it's just chilling. hanging out. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then a, sol then a solar storm blowing on it from here will mm -hmm. hit it. You'll see it, and it Look, oh my it gosh, pushes look everything in. Okay. So now it compresses all this, plus it takes field, magnetic field, and it opens it up. And it doesn't break it. Uh -huh. I mean, it doesn't like, like destroy it. It just takes it and folds it back. 
Yeah. And it takes the next one and then it folds it back and it folds it back. That's why suddenly everything got a lot smaller here. It wasn't just that it compressed it. It also peeled the layers back. So as it peeled it back, then you have stuff entering this way down yeah. here. And what happens is that the tail, which you can see the, the magnetic field lines here, they get longer and longer and longer. And as they get longer and longer and longer, they begin to pull back almost like a slingshot. And as you continue to pull that slingshot back, eventually these, these, the field lines come here and they crush and get so close and crush themselves and they touch. Mm -hmm. And when they touch, because they're actually, and I'm not going to go into the details, but they point, they, they, the magnetic field is pointing in opposite directions here. And when they touch, it's like you break the slingshot and it slingshots everything forward. And because the particles that get shot forward, mm -hmm. they get shot they have to follow the magnetic field line. So where do they go? Here. And, and I'm also seeing just from that reddish arc, it almost seems mm -hmm. like it's opening a this little hole. It's almost opening a little hole to the north and south pole. This is this here. These are called the cusps. Yeah. These always exist because mm -hmm. up in here, this is always open. These field lines are always open to the solar wind. This is why radiation storms penetrate I, in the north and south. I was just going to ask you that. So that's the connection to, to radiation right there. That's why it always, yeah, that's, and that's always that way. But when it comes to a big solar storm and all this density, that's what this red stuff is, it's meaning high density, it folds this stuff back and it, it, it loads what we call loading the tail. You'll watch this tail grow as I continue playing this. And then you'll watch what happens is you'll see the thing cross. You'll see, you'll see the magnetic field lines. The lines actually cross and make an X here. We call it an X line. <laughs> okay. okay. Not X-Men, but X line. <laughs> and you'll then watch it slingshot because what happens is that you'll get particles pushed both forward and back as the field lines break and you get okay. slingshots both this way and this way. Slingshots that go this way cause aurora. Because if the field, the particles get shot into the poles. Wow. Particles got shot this way; they just mm -hmm. get shot down tail, and it's like the like the Earth becomes a big mag magnetic sh machine gun. Watch this. So as you're continuing to see this, you'll see the flux continue to refold and unfold. Mm -hmm. It's just basically doing what I call the the chicken dance. If you ever watch any of my mini courses on YouTube, I talk about the chicken dance, and it's you actually get to see me dancing while I'm doing the magnetic field this way, right. this way. So this is literally layers of the slinky that are recombining, if you will, yep. reconnecting. Yep. It. Flipping from the back and yeah. connecting to the front and then and then unfolding again, depending upon what, what the magnetic uh configuration is of the solar wind. Oh, it's now they're gonna show they're gonna show a big scary one. Here's what happens when a, you'll see in a minute. Okay, well, this is a, another storm, but you'll see I think they're gonna show another bigger one. But here's a little bit stronger storm. So it compresses, okay. you can see the heart of that magnetic system a little bit better. You can still see all of this and you can see the lobes, it's what we call the lobes, opening or closing depending upon how much pressure is being put on the the, uh, the system. Right. Now I'm going to see if this one has the Carrington event in it because it might. And I might as well let it play um, so you can see if it does. Every hand's worst nightmare. <laughs> well, every every now watch this. This will be the 1859. Oh. oh, my gosh. <laughs> now, look at this. Look at this machine gun. Oh, no, yeah. Just, just... <laughs> and that's almost a, that's almost a right. resonance effect, right? Because it's yeah. it's pushing uh -huh. against, it's bouncing back and forth. Almost well, what's at... happening? No, it's not a resonance effect. This okay. thing is actually, it's actually what's happening is there's so much junk being forced into the lobes and forced into this okay. region. Okay, okay. That that what we call reconnection where the X lines are being made, it's happening so much that it's just constantly, it's like the gun, uh, taking a gun and just firing magazines. It's constantly being reloaded with more bullets. And it's just, <laughs> there's just, just too much material. We're having to deal with just too, too much, much material because okay. it has to shed it. It can't right. shed all of it into the earth's system. Right. But look how much flux it peeled back. Holy smokes. There's nothing left. There's almost nothing. Well, there's a couple, there's yeah. a little bit left, but I call it like the bangs in the face and a normal, normal <laughs> magnetic system the okay. bangs are in the face but then when you get on the freeway it's like blows everything back right you stick your head out the window and your bangs get blown back that's what's happening here is the I, earth's magnetic systems bangs are it's sticking its head out on the freeway going 120 miles an hour <laughs> right so question then obviously the 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 worst case scenario of this is if you blow all of those layers away do you just lose it does it just no because no, the, the core just returns the away the core you will return it eventually or you know the magnetic flux is mm -hmm. neither created nor destroyed. It's just altered. So okay. what it's doing is that it's it's up to, remember, the, co the core of the Earth is what's creating that, that magnetic system. That's the second chef is literally the core so of the Earth that's creating it, right? It's, it's creating the, mm -hmm. the, the, the magnetic dynamo. So when we see it really even up close, okay, it's blown back quite a bit, but you still see a couple loops. Yeah. 
So this is still protecting us, but I guarantee you the aurora is open all the way, all the way. We're having aurora all the way to the to the equator of Earth because we've opened. What's happened is wow. that you peel back all this flux. You peel back so many of the bangs and right. thrown them back that the auroral oval, which basically is the boundary between what we call open and closed field, uh -huh. it's gone. It's opened so much that the southern, the northern pole and the southern pole auroral ovals have reached the equator and they've wow. met in the middle. Yeah, this is awesome. that's what's happened. But it doesn't blow our atmosphere away. It's not. This isn't a planet killer. We've survived okay. quite a few of these. Mm -hmm. 1859 was just one of many. So you know, we've actually had them. We actually, we actually got clipped by a Carrington event not that long ago. In fact, in 2017. I I remember that update, and that was the whole thing of it oh, yeah. wasn't pointed at Earth, but it was a, a very similar effect. I remember that. Yeah. Right. Right. And that was that was one of the events. That was the event I was going to talk about, but I don't think we have time. Um, you know how it goes. 60 minutes flies by. Oddly enough, it you're, flies by. It, you're already like we could keep going. But I, you know, for the sake of time, <laughs> this, um, is, this is my last chart. OK, this, yeah. I, think, I think this is my last either my last or clo close to the last one. Let's see. I don't want to hold you oh, too yeah. long, but thank you for taking the time. Yeah, no, of course not. Not a problem. So when I was talking about what I wanted to tell you is that when when we deal with the Earth's magnetic system, it really does. This is what I meant when I mean scrambling, scrambling the the, the eggs. These are particles moving in the Earth's magnetic system. So once all that stuff, that junk gets thrown into the Earth's magnetic, in, into the magnetosphere, this is what the second chef does with them. Not only does it cause these particles to spiral around the magnetic field lines that you see, but it causes them to bounce back and forth. And then when they bounce back and forth, that's what you're seeing up here. That That is now drifting, what we call drifting all the way around. So not only do the particles spiral around the field, they bounce to the north and to the south, and then they also drift all the way around the Earth in these bouncing tubes. So that is the scrambling of the eggs. Mm, okay. So when you see this kind of stuff inside the Earth's magnetic system, you can tell just by looking at how complicated this is, that there's just no way that when the first chef is throwing eggs at Earth, that any interaction inside the Earth's magnetic system is going to make sense if you don't know how that, how that system is interacting. And so this is what it does to the ionosphere, right? Mm -hmm. You've got all the neutral stuff happening from from below. You've got all the atmospheric weather happening. You've got the plasma bubbles. You've got the scintillation and the turbulence of the currents and the waves, gravity waves, all sorts of things happening from below. And then you have space weather happening from above. And so the ionosphere you, that you guys live in is literally like the cream filling of an Oreo cookie. And it's constantly getting squished and okay. from both above and below. And it makes this very complicated ballet. Look at all these different phenomena that are occurring. Mm -hmm. So uh, no amateur radio operator should ever feel bad and feel that they're not doing a good job because they're not getting contacts or they had a contact and they got lost it and they couldn't get it again. It's not your fault. It's not your rig. Most often it's the ionosphere. Uh, unless it's some cheap Chinese electronics from uh, Wish.com, then that, that's a, that's our problem. If that is us, go. yeah, if we're doing that, go. that's that's bad. That's our bad. There you go. But here's one thing. You know, mm -hmm. first of all, the Whisper and the and the Reverse Beacon networks, they, networks like that, that are able to kind of look at at the now time propagation. That's really going to be the best way to tell whether propagation is good right now, because we just don't have models that can do all this, at least not in real time. Right. But one thing you can do, if, and this is my caution with data and indices, is that as you now know, right, solar flares and solar storms are not the same thing. And when you're looking at KP and AP, just for those who know, KP is a three-hour average of how the Earth's magnetic shield is wiggling, right? Mm -hmm. So all that, that second shift, how it's wiggling. And AP is simply a 24-hour average of... This. So you take all these three-hour averages uh, for over a course of a day, mm -hmm. and you make one number, and that's AP. That's okay. So AP is only two. one. That's a horrible mm -hmm. sample size, then, right? Because exactly. you've got so no much one, data. Yeah. No amateur radio operator should ever use AP. Period. If you're using KP, then you know what the Earth's Good. magnetic system was doing three hours ago. Okay. It's still not great. There are other ways to do it, but just I know KP and AP are used so much. So just know that, but realize this, this is KP and AP are far better for knowing the night side, what's going on with the night side with solar storms, because when the earth's magnetic field is wiggling, that's when KP and AP are high. Mm. Okay. When you want to deal with day side pro radio propagation, you need to look at, you know, your F 10.7 fine, but you only get one daily value. 
look very often, if you want to take a look at what's going on with solar flares and radio bursts, you can look at X-ray flux, at least for the solar flare, the ionosphere part, and DRAP, mm. right? And that's what you worry about with with uh, with solar flares is you look at that those proxies for day side phenomena, okay, and day side effects. So that's you know keep th that's what's kind of conflicting and what's kind of difficult, especially when people conflate both solar storms or rather CMEs with solar flares. They think they can use these phenomena for both day side and night side, and it really doesn't work like that. Uh. Yes, so, and, and we do. We okay. often throw up the AP in particular, and I and I've I've long said AP is probably not the way to do a lot of this stuff because it's it's just too it, it's condensing the data too much, right? It's just so averaged out that it's it's not very useful. But then, yeah, exactly. for the high side, you do need the X-ray flux. So I do. Oh man, this was this was fantastic. Did this uh, help? Okay. Oh, this cool. is fantastic, uh, Tamitha. Awesome. I, I, I honestly would say, you know, this isn't holding you to the spot, but we need to have you back again to no. go into some of these other stuff that you've sure. got because I know we couldn't get through all of it. But what are you on? Uh, how much time you got for questions? Because I know there's some questions. Uh, as as much chat. as you need. Much as you need. Oh, okay. I love that. Okay. Yes. And so the first question, of course, is do I do I have my mason jar? And yes, I do. Good. So somebody asked a question, which I, I, I think is a fun one. Uh, it, it's probably down the uh, the, the tinfoil hat a bit. But uh, what would happen if we had a Carrington-like event and it hit Earth appropriately, and, you know, where people lived kind of thing today? From your point of view, what do you think would happen? Well, <clears throat> it depends. You know, and this is part of the reason why I'm trying desperately to get, excuse me, Excuse me. I'm trying to get space weather as a as a something that we're we're training meteorologists to do. I mean, that's that's the whole reason why I started the whole Millersville program, Millersville University program, where I'm training terrestrial meteorologists in in space weather expertise, is because I don't think we are as at the mercy of a Carrington class event as most people would like to think. Mm -hmm. Now, back in the 70s, you know, sure, we, we've had issues and there were, thank goodness we didn't have the types of technologies that we have today because there were lots of things that that occurred uh, that were horrible um, with these, these Carrington class events when they hit. But today, not only are we a bit smarter in the fact that we don't have hundreds and hundreds of miles of unbroken power lines, uh, because that's mainly that's the sure. real big issue. Because they have... turn into antennas, basically. It, well, it's not, like a well, long antenna. Sort of, sort mm -hmm. of. What happens? What happens is that remember you've got a big magnetic field, and and those for those people who who know electricity and magnetism to to some degree, you know that when you wiggle, this is a magnetic field. If you wiggle this magnetic field in time, then you are going to create an electric field, induce it in anything that can conduct electricity. So when the Earth's magnetic field is wiggling, which is what's happening when that sec second chef is scrambling one of the eggs that the sun gives us, well, that magnetic field, even though it's not very strong, the Earth's field is, is only about as strong as a mid-fridge magnet. The problem is that Earth, mag you know, the magnetic field is massive. I mean, it's a, it's a fridge magnet the size of Earth when you look at it that <laughs> right, way. And so, right. right. So then what happens is that in the bedrock itself, it's metal, right? We've got metal rock, right? We got they're, they're, they can be magnetized, so you can get electrons and potential that wants to flow, or at least dipoles that want to align, and you can create a potential, induce it right into the bedrock, and because Earth's magnetic field is so big, it can induce it over a very large distance, and that means a little bit of potential over a large distance adds up, right? It's oh, what we call integral. Sure. So now you have right. So so what that affects then is not pacemakers or your car battery or your your computer it's not going to blow up or anything it doesn't uh, you think your cell phone isn't going to melt in your hand uh but it does cause things that are big so like let's say if your cell phone was the size of lake michigan well okay then maybe i'd worry right it has to be big structures okay so, so then it's power grids that's why power grids are so susceptible and how they're susceptible is not because it induces it straight in the lines but it's inducing in the bedrock and if you think of the bedrock it's not very conductive, right? It's like kind of like a, a jam-packed traffic or jam. pockets right? of conductivity do. too, right? Yeah, right, but they're, on... but, they're, but they're locked and, you know, it's kind Sporadic. of Sporadic, like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like commute traffic. You can't really get through if it's a, if it's a you know, a pileup or something. Right. But what they see, what they end up seeing is that the transformers for the power end lines are anchored into the ground, right into the bedrock. Mm -hmm. So that is like an on-ramp onto the freeway. <laughs> right, 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 them, right, right. Zip, right? Right. So of course they're going to take it. So that the all of that stuff, that free energy, I mean, it's green energy, if you really want to call it that. Too bad we can't harness it well. 
But that green energy, that free energy comes up into the power lines and literally decides to, you know, go conduct down the power lines. And so that's how it's induced into the power lines. It's not a direct induction, but rather from the bedrock, it comes up. And, and so that stuff can be a real problem for us, but a lot of our, our power grids anymore, you know, we've, we, we're used to rolling blackouts. We're used to having to rein in our power consumption. And honestly, if space weather were out on the six o'clock news and someone said, okay, a Carrington class event is coming, guys, everybody from this hour to this hour, please reduce your power consumption. Because what happens with these power grids is that they need to, they're, they're, they can handle the, the, the power coming into the lines as long as they don't have to distribute power. Because right. the, the power that comes in, that free power, they've got to absor absorb it like a like a. Again, here's a, another thing with the spring. They're they're good at distributing power, not actually coming off the lines and storing off of it. It's kind of the problems we right. have with, with and, some of the way we handle grid and solar and all that battery offloading people are doing and these the, days. Exactly. And the, exactly yeah. the induction, right? You know, right. I look at it as like a, once again a spring, right? You've got the potential to deliver. Right. If you and you can store by pushing energy, you know, you know, cocking the spring. And then of course you let go and it springs forward. Well, this would be true delivery of the power. Right. But when you get free power, you have to cock that spring. Where does it go? To be able right. To, and right. And if you're trying to deliver power at the same time, you have less what we call reactive power. So if you lower the load on these power lines or these power companies and the utility companies, then you are affording them more reactive power to absorb. You're allowing that spring to, 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 to be loaded more with this free power. And so they ride out the storm. Mm. And that's one of the cool things about the power grid is it's so springy. It, it, it allows for this kind of flexibility mm -hmm. to absorb power and then deliver it. But how, how we help is by reducing our desire for the, for the true the, power. The draw, so that they can right. And so then that allows the stuff that's a part of that grid to be able to take up some of that load for right. the moments where it happens or whatnot. Right. Oh, and, man, and I didn't it, even really think about it that doesn't, like that, but yeah. And when it doesn't, when it doesn't work, when so, so some of the historical events like the 1989 event when the Toronto Stock Exchange went down and the Hydro Quebec grid, grid failed, what happened there is not so much that they didn't take the power lines and power uh, systems offline fast enough. No, that's actually what happened. They took the, they had all these protective relay circuits. They didn't know that when these. The, the the transformers started getting this extra power and started heating up. The protective relay circuits started firing and Which shutting down. Disconnected parts of the, grid. the the capability to absorb it. Exactly. Yes. So, oh, I love this. And okay. That's what caused the cascading collapse. Right. Okay. Was that they took off? They took the power grid out. They made it more susceptible because they took off reactive power. And so what was still left wow. was still dealing with all that free energy, but had less reactive power to take and absorb it. And eventually they just, it was too much. And so the whole thing cascaded in death. Right. And so that's the big deal now is that with our power grids, what we do is that the first thing that, that the power consumption companies do when we reach a G2 level storm or above is they turn off all their protective relays. Funny, Be because just, just to have a, just, just to spread the load because they got to distribute because, it all. Like, what do we because, do with all this? Exactly. Right. Irrespective, you've got to ride it out. You have to write it out. So that's where the public can be of so much benefit. And I think so much so that the power companies, I don't think they understand that yet. C could you imagine Could you imagine trying to explain this to just every Joe citizen? Like, by the way, guys, we can't have the security relays turned on anymore. We got to have, we got to spread the load. So the best thing you do is not charge your car, not be running, da, 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 da. You can't be on the cable, television, all that stuff. Like, oh, but my I, gosh. But I tell you, but marketing nightmare, that, right? marketing nightmare. <laughs> True. But we, but hang, hang on, we already okay. do that because when we have rolling blackouts and trust me, people are so scared of a Carrington class event, sending us back to the dark ages. They are. Yes. They will shut off every light in the house. They will that's absolutely, hilarious. you know, I'll turn to, off to all my led out. bulbs. I'm helping. I'm helping. That's that's <laughs> exactly. And, and it, and it's funny because, you know, that's one thing that people don't realize is that, and, and they, what they hate being, they hate being helpless in these catastrophic situations. So if they feel that they can be empowered to help, that will, they will do it in a heartbeat, right? Who doesn't want to help mitigate a sure. disaster? Yeah. Uh, gosh, we got we got a couple, uh, by the way, questions. If you do questions or at Ham Radio Crash Course, that, that's how we see them. We're not going to take a ton because we're already over hour, but th this is just all good <laughs> stuff. So I, I can't I can't really so turn off the done. I can't turn off the spigot on this information because it's too good. So this is an interesting one. So uh, help Paul out here. 
could long distance DX transmission, so long distance, we're just talking long distance, potentially improve during a solar flare? Could the same be said about solar storms? Could we be min-maxing and, and getting long distance communication by working with a storm, kind of, I think yes. is where they're going? Yes, but it depends upon where you are. Location, location, location is critical. If you notice right behind me, okay, this side, no, this side. Uh, if you notice here, for example, this is a solar flare, okay? And if you can hopefully see the map of the world behind it, a great way, a great way to get DX, let's say you're up here, great way to get DX would be on this edge and just skirting this edge over to here, okay? Or trans, or, or trans hemispheric, skirting this edge if you can get down in here. Anywhere in what would be the, the gray line, you will find wonderful propagation and waveguides. So I've noticed that where you will or you'll have polar routes that you'll be able to take that you wouldn't be able to take otherwise. So it depends upon where you are. If you're in the middle of this mess, probably not. Right. You just have to write it out but and wait it out. But if you're on the hairy edge, absolutely, you can get really fun propagation. Now, as far as solar storms are concerned, well, sure, aurora, right? That's one way you can play with a storm. You can use directional antennas, and it doesn't matter where you are on the globe. You can point to the pole and see if you can get some auroral propagation. That helps. But also, again, anywhere where you have the fundamental charge layers in and around, you know, around the edges, you can find that these, these areas, because of the conductivity changes, remember I was talking about refraction? Because of the conductivity changes in and around these areas, right around the edges, you can actually create these little waveguides that somehow allow you to have more skip. Yeah. Multi, multiple skips. Okay. So that it is possible, but remember we are talking about cloud-like formations and even Aurora can be extremely dynamic and, and, and movable and changeable. So something that lasts, you know, so you're playing with stuff that's going to be changing quite frequently. So how long of a contact will you have? Mm -hmm. May not be very long, maybe enough for an FT8 or something, right? Just a quick in out, but is it, are you going to be able to rag chew that way? Mm, no. Kind of hard. Yeah. Interesting. So, so, and you can also, the funny thing is in, um, I remember, I think it was the 1972 event in August, which was a Carrington class event. Um, amateur radio operators in Russia, uh, they, they reported being able to use a sporadic E layer that came down into the mid latitudes in Russia because of the radiation storm that was happening at the poles. So there was enough convection that it was bringing all of the extra, cause they're like cosmic ray showers. And so, because that's what these particles do, they cause like this cosmic ray, we call a polar cap absor absorption event. Okay. And so it causes uh, extra ionization and it propagated clear down into the E layer and created sporadic E that wouldn't oh. have been there otherwise. Oh, so you're working sporadic E on higher frequency, or sorry, lower frequency ham lower radio frequencies. technically. Ooh, 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 that's interesting. And that so check out sporadic E as well. Yeah. That that honestly goes back to the whole concept of like earlier when we started talking, you know, when you brought up Mars. That's yeah. potentially what you could be yeah. facing is that you'd have these wild sporadic E's at much lower frequencies than we expect. Right. Oh, that's right. that's if, fascinating. But Mars is very very strange because it doesn't have as ordered a magnetic field as, as what Earth has. Okay. Because it doesn't have an active dynamo. It just has the residual magnetic field from from uh, when it was, when it had a magnetic dynamo like what we have now. It's a lot of people look at Earth, Mars, and Venus um, as a kind of a, a, a timeline where mm -hmm. Venus- Because Mars Venus is dead, is, not a hot core. Right. It's pretty much a dead rock. And and neither neither Venus nor Mars have uh, have a an active magnetic field. They don't have this magnetic shield like what we have. Oh, Venus, Venus doesn't. doesn't. I, didn't, I didn't even think no. about that, but sure. And Venus doesn't because its core is still completely liquid. But as it cools, it becomes like Earth. Earth has like a slushy. So imagine going to 7-Eleven and getting a right. Slurpee or something. A, a has that slushy. slushy and, that's right. And yeah. molten slushy. <laughs> and that's why it's actually got this dynamo going. And I won't go into the details of how that happens, but it has to do with convection. And so, so Earth has an active dynamo. But once it cools and solidifies completely, it'll be like Mars. And that's when our dynamo will die. And that's when our atmosphere will go away. Right. So, so when we look at Venus, we can look at it and say that was Earth's past. And we look at Mars and we say, that's Earth's future. Mm. Scary. Wild, but I mean, we'll be, we'll be long gone by then, right? We'll be long gone. 
we'll be long gone, so, so we'll be he fine. Here's a question on kind of understanding some of this. This is from Chris. So what is the solar proton flux signify? Is this the amount of sun juice hitting us? This is a logarithmic scale? Question mark, I guess, is where they're going. Solar solar proton flux so are we talking the energetic which which because you have low energy protons you have high energy protons i'm I, not sure which they didn't proton specify flux. so so maybe quickly if you had uh if you could break down the two if if we have so so the solar protons if we're talking about uh solar particle events we're talking about the energetic particles so it's basically a radiation storm and that pro because mainly radiation storms are they're mainly protons at least the part that we care about. We have electrons too, but they don't do as much damage. It's really the protons that cause the, the, the big issues for us. And yes, those are the things that injure satellites, as a matter of fact. They're the same particles, in fact, that we see in the radiation belts. They get energized to, to the same levels. Um, in radiation belts, in the inner radiation belts, actually right. a little bit higher, in fact. But uh, when we get these solar proton events, if that's what you're talking about, um, they can only penetrate so far and what they are, when you're talking about the flux, you're talking about the number of particles that are penetrating through a particular size, particular diameter per second. So that's really what flux is, is it's not just the number of particles, because then you have to ask, well, how big is your, your detector? You know, yeah. what we call the geometric factor of the detector. So we create a standard size, and we say how many particles are going through that standard size per second. And, and that really is the radiation storm, if we're talking about that. And it's typically measured at the GOES spacecraft, which is at the geosynchronous orbit, which is, you know, it's still inside the heart of the magnetosphere, but it's just on the hairy edge. It's just located just on the outer edge of the outer, outer radiation belt, in fact. Hopefully that answered that question. I, I hope they're the one that asked it, so maybe they'll yeah, come back. Yeah, I don't here. know. So we got a super chat from uh, William here. And this is, <laughs> this is actually some ham radio history. Uh, can planetary alignments affect propagation i read a book where rca had an hf forecaster who did that name long forgotten this is from uh, 73 from w8lv bill so a bit of ham radio history we're 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 getting so far into planetary alignments dictating hf propagation is that even possible uh, i well you know we do moon, we do moon bounce we know that we can hear AKR from jo from the Jovian system. Jupiter mm -hmm. is very loud, right? When we do that, now how, does it affect radio propagation? I'm not sure that the that the the any effect any effect that we would see at the Earth system would be strong enough because because they're we, not, not close enough. Like because they have no, to actually affect that. the uh, the element the the layers of the atmosphere, right? Right. Yeah, and you can pull and there is a little bit of tidal influence, but the problem is you if to tell for sure, you would have to be able to subtract off the effect of the moon and you'd have to subtract off the effect of any space weather that was occurring and you'd also have to subtract off the fact that the earth's magnetic system is loud as well. There's all sorts right. of of, of uh, you know noise that radio noise that the earth's magnetic system's making with with you know Electron cyclo, electron ion cyclotron waves, you know, e, what we call emic waves or plasma hiss. You've got right. there's just there's you know there's ULF waves near it, the magnetopause. Uh, there's all sorts of things that are going on, the, and so I don't know how to back all that out. Well, yeah, the scientific experiment for this is too complicated, and every variable is loud and angry, right? Is like because right. because everything could be like how do you subtract any one of those things right. other than because because you, you can't draw a median. There's no there's no normality to any of it, right? So if if mercury is in yeah. retrograde down the street it, it doesn't matter how close it is to us because our norm is already completely chaotic it would be it, too difficult it, it, exactly it's so hard to back all that out <laughs> it's kind of the same question when people ask me about do, does earthquakes earthquakes affected by space weather and i say that's so hard to answer it likely is the answer is likely yes but sure. it's so down in the noise compared to the 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 primary drivers which is the geological drivers right right that that's that's earth tech tect plate tectonic and all of that, um, that we don't notice it. We can't see, you know, we'd have to subtract that off. And until we understand those drivers and, and are able to predict them, we can't subtract them off to be able to quantify what's what's left. Oh, yeah. God, what a, that's that's a fun one, too. Uh, yeah, that's a fun Dino, one. Dino Papa says, uh, oh, wait, wait, hold on one more. Uh, this is from AI5DD said, thank you, Dr. T. Loved the hour from Joseph. So thank you for oh, that. You're very welcome. Thanks. I appreciate you guys hanging on this long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was a question. Uh, what, or sorry, would an EM 
EMP be easily mitigated in the same way as a Carrington event? I now we're getting the EMP question. So you, we, we've gone far enough into the uh, past the hour, it's, so it's time. <laughs> it's perfect. No, it's perfect. Actually, you may not realize this, but a, a, a big geomagnetic storm, which is a big solar storm that hits Earth, the Earth's reaction to it is a geomagnetic storm. So when I when I showed that movie of the Earth's magnetic field and the machine gun down the tail mm -hmm. and all that stuff, that is what we call a geomagnetic storm, okay? Yep. Believe it or not, when a big solar storm like a Carrington event hits Earth, it actually causes an EMP. It causes what we call the E3 component of an EMP. And why is that? Well, let me grab my slinky, of course. When you have a big storm hitting Earth, boom, mm -hmm. and it compresses that Earth's magnetic field really fast, right? Because it's the, it's the, even if you have a bumper car, right, that, that doesn't have the right magnetic configuration, all it is is just a, like a brick wall that hits earth. It's going to squish that front end of that magnetic system sure. down really hard. Okay. That change, that quick change, when you take a magnetic field and you squeeze it together really fast, it's, if, if any of those, any people who actually, you know, look at magnetic field lines or, or, or familiar with it. Magnetic field lines that are far apart mean a weak field. Magnetic mm -hmm. field lines that are squished together and close together mean strong field. So when you compress that magnetic field really hard, you up that field strength real fast in time. What does that do? It literally creates a potential, uh, electric potential that's extremely strong and spiky. What is that? That's an EMP. Now, it's called the E3 component because it's the slowest. There are three components. To, a, to e a traditional, like if you had a hemp high-altitude explosion, there's three, right? There's three right. effects to that. The, or three the first one the first one is like a, a, a detonation, right? That That's right. the weaponized one. Right. That's the, that's the E1 component. It's very fast, but it's very local. But it's very dangerous, right? It can knock out cities. Right. E2, I believe, is lightning, right? It's, uh, it's, it's also different frequency E2? spaces that they technically affect too, is right? It, Thank you. Well, yeah, that's my it, it's understanding to be because they act over different, different time, you know, different time ranges. But there's but E1 and right. E2 are still reasonably fast, like really fast and and strong, but all localized. Uh, it the depends. E3, so if you're talking high altitude, so if the mm -hmm. explosion was high altitude, then the E1 effect is going to be somewhat mitigated because you're you're above the, con the, the contiguous United States. It's the E2 and the E3s that would be pushing down, you know. That's the, the question. I think a lot of people, this is where that comes up, is the difference well, the, of where it's at. Well, and also remember, the E3 component is slow. Right, now, right, right, right. Relatively right. speaking. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So a lot of power companies aren't that worried about the E3. They feel they can ride that out mm -hmm. because it's slow enough. But when you get a big storm, then the E3 can be fast enough. And remember, with a geomagnetic storm, with an Earth, with a, a, an E3 caused by a, a geomagnetic storm, by caused by a big solar storm, mm -hmm. it's global. We're not talking about sure. You guys, you're talking field. about way more power that's being pushed out than right, it, if a nation exploded a bomb over the U.S. I, I yep. I'm mixing the message a bit here because I got I I went off on the the high altitude explosion thing. Your your focus on what the sun's doing. I I get that. And I apologize. Right. Uh, well, I'm talking about an E3 component yeah. from a solar storm. Got that's, it. Because yeah. that's kind of what we were talking about. Is it is it is it the same thing? And I'm and I'm saying the geomagnetic storm is not the same thing as a as an EMP, but a geo the the what we call the sudden storm commencement, which is when the damn thing hits and just you know lambast us mm -hmm. it literally is the earth's magnetic system gets gets hit by a brick wall compresses it super fast and that causes a global slow relatively speaking but global emp so it's weak yet it does occur and it can knock out power systems if it's if it's uh um, especially at low latitudes and the reason why is because the magnetic field strength of earth's system is super super strong at low latitudes C considering what ham radios are being sensitive you know measurement devices if you get right down to it and putting up big you know uh, big antennas and whatnot should we be worried that they would damage our radios hypothetically right in some cases it, it has to just statistically I, you but. know i've seen it here's here's the interesting thing and this is where i have to go to anecdotal information uh -huh. because if i talk to a, a colleague i talk to scientists they would say no nah, probably not but mm -hmm. the thing is <laughs> Anytime we've gotten over a G2 to a G, like a G3 storm or above, okay, so these are, if this, the scales go to five, we didn't get a chance to talk about, about the, the, the solar, the, the scales, yeah. no space weather scales. Yeah. But a, the G category, which is for geomagnetic storms, which you see here, the scales go from one to five on all three of these different categories. So if we get to a G3 level, okay, what I've heard time and time again 
especially people who live in dusty areas where there's wind and it's dry, humidity is low. Okay. During a G3, they will get shocks. If they have to work on their antenna, if they have to get anywhere in there, but during the geomagnetic storm, it doesn't matter if it's daytime or nighttime, they have a much static, higher incidence. Because of a static buildup? Now, I do know that That's the E layer can propagate and actually dump charge into big uh, cloud, you know, big like cumulonimbus clouds and mm -hmm. hurricanes and mm -hmm. actually intensify. Uh, the number of lightning strikes and there's also there's gravity wave communication and all that kind of stuff. So I do know that there is coupling into the neutral atmosphere. How that comes down to us at the lower levels, I don't know. Wow. But I do know anecdotally that there have been an inordinate number of amateur radio operators, especially in Perth. <laughs> I've had where oh, they live in interesting. large okay. ranges and of, it's of dust. Arid. Yeah, a lot very arid. arid. Yeah. Very arid and very dusty. And they're out, you know with lots of land around them that doesn't have much much water, they end up getting more shocked more often. But the storms have to be strong. Oh, so man, fascinating. take that for what it is. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just giving you the information that has come to me. So Kenny Ray says, Josh, you make sure she comes back again. <laughs> so we will do that <laughs> because I, I, I think everybody, no one really knows how many slides she has, except I got a little sneak peek. <laughs> and we just barely touched the they're all good they're all this good so if you enjoyed this uh and 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 dr good. t if you're willing to come back we, we would love to have Absolutely. you william gave a little bit more of a background on that uh that hf uh propagation of the planetary alignments the forecaster's name was maxwell oscar johnson from july 18th 1892, 1892. to may 21st 1951 certainly he oh, must have published some research 73 d e w 8 l v bill and so there was a question uh that possibly even the discovery down. of the van allen belt might have uh, come after his pronostications yes. so it's entirely possible that we're talking about like uh the humors in our blood at this point with with with, with what he was like thinking about right the I'm, miasma I'm he, he, this is me uh space miasma level of of uh work that they that he might have been working on that's that's really intriguing that now, is there's interesting lots of different there's lots of different analyses and and some of them really have have some of them are 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 very true like um the scientist uh, that we now know as uh, what we know for the Hale cycle for example i think it's william hale i forget his first name mm -hmm. but his his work was was poo pooed for a long time and forgotten and now it's slowly being resurrected because of the work that he had done literally in the beginning of the 1900s was just really insightful and people mm -hmm. kind of just let it go thinking it wasn't it wasn't important uh, but we're finding out that as we learn more about the solar dynamo, that it really is important. And the diff different hemispheres don't act in concert with one another all the time, which is partly why some cycles are larger and some cycles are smaller. So that it's it, that's why I write this stuff down is because there's a lot of times there's these scientists that really have revolutionary ideas and they end up being right on the money. But mainstream science doesn't doesn't see it at mm -hmm. that time because it doesn't fall. You know, either there's nobody's chasing that information or the prevailing theories at the time are not. You know, they don't concert with that. Uh, Eugene Parker had that problem when he first talked about the solar wind. It almost took 20 years for people to accept the fact that the solar wind was real. Uh, so this kind of thing happens all the time. But then again, there are also other scientists who go off on a tangent and they are disproven. And so science sure. moves on. Right. Right. So it's, well, that's it's hard science. to know which, which side he falls on. <laughs> that's exactly the kind of science we want is where claims are you know, studied by other people and challenged, and we stick right. to what at least is backed by evidence, right? That's always the goal. So, right. At least, but right. you know, what I want to see. That's, but that's why I wrote that down because I'm going to go take a look. Sure. You know, because in even my if it's free time, <laughs> it, it's possible that he could be 90% wrong, but there was like a 10% of something that actually There's has a gem. ringing of truth or, or, or at least something that could be investigated, right? Absolutely. Oh, Tamitha, this has been amazing. I I cannot tell. Oh, First, we haven't gone this long on a on a live stream in a long time. No, this is good. This is good because <laughs> okay, it was okay. nonstop information. Everybody in the chat is screaming. You got to come back. In fact, I think our our yeah. our numbers have just gone up and up of people watching. So they oh, right on. everybody's loving this. The fact you took the time to do this and and build all this and everybody's just shocked she's standing this whole time. Yes, <laughs> we can't yeah. get her to sit down, guys. I'm telling you. 
on Ham Nation. No, we had her on a show, a whole live stream. She stood the whole time, and we're like, "Guys, get her! A Somebody get her this woman a chair." No, uh, I teach, I teach, I teach classes on the green screen. So I'm very, so I'm doing I, this for my mini courses on my own channel. I teach. I'll do three, three and a half hours straight. But I'll take breaks, of course, but I'm, sure. I'm not sitting down the entire time I'm well, up. So, so let's, this, let's, is a, this is not a problem. Let's dedicate that to you a little bit. So let's go back to the web and, and let me bring you in here. Hold on one second oh, as I get the you. zoom That's in. Kind. Uh, let, let's point people to where they can go for more information from, from Dr. T. So obviously you got the website, but you also have a Patreon. Right. And I want to make sure people find that. So how, how do we go about that? Because this right. is like um, what you do. You, you could do that. You do this every month, every yeah. week. You're, you're giving yeah. this information out. And if, you, if you're a member of your Patreon, on what do people get if they well, if they well even okay they don't even have to go that far you can actually get stuff for free so like for all my courses are always done uh open everybody on uh, if in the public gets it and if you if you go and it's because they're on youtube and on my website if you go i think it says mini course curriculum if you click on that on that link right there mm -hmm. you will actually see a little video that that where i actually go through what the mini courses are because i've done like 30 of them now and wow. so it's you know it's a whole it's a whole like a full year worth of courses. Mm -hmm. And I actually walk people through how to, how to take them, how you start, what you, what phenomena you will get when you do this course and you know, these different courses in succession, there are prerequisites for some courses, but not for others. And that kind of just helps people understand what they're, what they're getting. And it's, it's all about the first chef and the second chef. Now, if you're on my Patreon, uh, yeah, where do we you, find that? Cause it, you, you gotta, you gotta add that link to the website. I don't do see I not it. Have that on the, I don't, I don't have it, it on the website. I see I all I your, I see your also other socials, but I don't see the Patreon. Wow. We okay. Well, it's, sp I, I'm, I'm surprised. I thought I had that. Um, yeah, I have to fix that. So it's space weather woman. It's Patreon and space weather woman. And I say it on all of my forecasts. I have, I have the, the, the link and I have, uh, I have it on the, the trailer of, you know, the end, the end bumper of all my forecasts. So I'm surprised. I thought I had it on my, my website. Isn't that terrible? How I awful get it. Of I found it. Okay, good. There it is. No, yes. you, you know what? I'm guilty of that as well. I do that all the time. <laughs> There's just too many social media things we have There's to keep in front of. There's just too many. many. Yes. So it's hard to keep it uh, uh, straight. Oh, did so I miss it? You... Somebody says you might have already had it. So if you already had oh, it, I, I apologize. I'm, I, okay, good. Yeah. I hope so I, I have. I hope, I hope so. I do. I hope but I will. Yeah. It's going to be one of the things I'll check when I'm when I'm offline here. Uh, but if you go there, it, there are obviously multiple tiers. The the um, even just the the oh, very even just good. following quite me. affordable. Even, yes, I love oh, it. Yeah, it, even just the following me at all without without even going on, you you get. Um, advance notice uh, about about 12 hours advance notice of uh, my my forecast you get to watch them early if you are on the five dollar which is the, the uh, space weather shorty uh forecast shorty tier then you get extra um forecasts i do basically once every i mean do like it'll end up being about twice a week i get forecasts done and then um so that's a bit good uh for people who want more forecasts than just what i could what i do on youtube mm -hmm. and then for um for the ten dollar, that's where you get in the mini courses. Now I do the mini courses for everyone, so everybody in the public sphere gets the mini courses. But those who are on that tier actually get to help me decide what my next subject should be, and they also get priority in me asking, answering questions. I also, if they ask questions early, I oftentimes will create slides to answer those questions specifically. And that's so something like we couldn't now, get to. We couldn't get to this live stream, but we were going to work right. through a custom thing based off of everybody in chat. But uh, yeah, maybe in the future we we'll do it. Maybe in the future. That's right. Yeah. So, so there's that, and there's uh, there's other tiers as well. But um, but our, our Patreon community is extremely. It's a tight knit family. We're all very uh, supportive and, and helpful with one another. Right now, we're actually doing Carrington class events. That was what everybody wanted, and and so we're going through all the different Carrington class events that we've had. Um, over the course of the space age and even prior. And there's a lot of them. People don't realize how many Carrington class events we get all the time. Nice. Oh, that was oh, awesome. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, boy, Tamitha, Dr. T, this has been amazing. I, I can't tell I'm you. So that, I, 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 I love this. I, I was geeking out in many different ways, and I know everybody in the chat was absolutely loving. We still have 500 people watching right now, which is just awesome. So it's all you. It's all you, because they're definitely not coming out for me on this one. So. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time. You're I really welcome. do appreciate it. I had I had a total blast, and and your your audience is fantastic. So thanks for the excellent questions. I really enjoyed it.
Well, uh, hang on, uh, Dr. T, please. We'll, we'll talk quickly after the chat, but I'm going to wrap things up because i got to take a big shout-out to our uh, Patreon supporters. My Patreon supporters, the producer levels, you all are the reason this show happened. Uh, multiple times we've done a, 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 a vote, and only recently I said, you know, I, could, uh, I, 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 I wonder, are people interested in space weather? And I just put out space weather. I didn't say Dr. T necessarily, but eventually it became the, I got to talk to Dr. T. Like, is that going to work out? Can we can we possibly do something? It immediately shot up to the top. It was the first thing people voted for. All the patrons voted Patrons voted for uh, that to, to, to make that happen. And it worked out so smoothly that I cannot tell you, I did not expect this. I, I actually put that too. I'm like, I will do a space weather video. I'd love to do this, but it will be Dr. T, you know, based on her schedule. So we'll we'll move this around as needed. And sure enough, I emailed her, I think it was Tuesday this week, and said, hey, love to have you on for a show, because uh, because everybody voted for it, of course. Love to have you on a show. Um, you know, could and I, I just kind of said, like, could you could you do a weekend show? And she just happened to have this weekend, so it worked out perfectly could not have been any better and so that was all thanks to you guys all the producers on my patreon the links are in the description if you'd like to help support the hammer new crash course to do more live streams like this and my other stuff that i do but this is probably one of the best live streams i've done in quite a long time dr t obviously doing this now that we all know for 10 years amazing at this absolutely brought everything fantastic do you know how often by the way, everybody watching this right now, I want, uh, I, I would like to, I'm an engineer. I, I do a lot of PowerPoint, a lot of slides, a lot of stuff like that. Have you noticed the difference in the quality of Dr. T's slides? Embedding video on the slides, showing, not just talking. See, that's the big problem with slides is you end up talking at the slides instead of demonstrating and showing and imparting knowledge through showing how it works. And that was incredibly valuable, I think, to numerous people all in the chat right now that are all saying the same thing. So we thank Dr. T so much. Please avail yourselves of the link in the description. Go check her out on her website, on YouTube, and the Patreon that we're linking um, in the live chat. And I will also put it in the description for this video. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'm going to play you out with some memes. 73 until I talk to you again. We will be doing the after chat. I know this is a little long. I'll do the after chat. You guys hang out. Don't worry. We'll get there. Ham's helping hams. We're still going to help you. Don't worry. We'll be talking. But give me 10, 15 minutes until I can get things turned around and we can go live again for the after chat. This was fantastic. Oh, very excited by this. Anyway, guys, enjoy the memes. I'm going to play you out. 73.